Greetings. If you would take your copy of God's Word and turn to Mark chapter 14, familiar passage beginning in verse 32. Here as I read the Word aloud, you may follow along if you desire. Hear now the Word of the Lord. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The grass may wither and the flower may fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. There's a lot of different things that you can focus on here. There's a lot of gold in this passage. And in fact, uh, if you are preaching on this passage, you may choose a lot of different areas uh, to dig into. You could dig into uh, weighty Christological issues, the, the nature of Christ and, and will, of not my will but yours uh, be done. And hopefully your professors here might talk to you a little bit about monothelitism, but that's not where I'm going today. Uh, second, you might dig into the biblical theology of the cup. What's going on there? Why does he use the language of the cup? And maybe you might uh, open up to Isaiah 51 or Jeremiah 25 and what the cup symbolizes there. What is Christ taking for us and especially what is he offered to his uh, disciples. So you could, you could take the, uh, the issue of the wills, you could take the issue of uh, the cup, but um, I'll leave that for you perhaps to explore. I just actually want to focus in on, on one sentence of instruction here that Jesus gives to his disciples for us to reflect on, especially I think relevant for those that are looking to go into ministry or to be associated with uh, those that are going into ministry or aiding those that go into ministry, and that's the simple instruction uh, from our Lord, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. These disciples are going to be heralds of the gospel. They're going to be shepherds of the church. And Christ, with a, a little time before his arrest and his trial, is economic with his words, which I hope to be as well, when he says to his disciples, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Watch and pray, and, and instead, they sleep. And we know from Luke that perhaps it was from sorrow, and so we can sympathize with them a little bit. But his instructions were not sleep and weep. His instructions were watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And, and I believe we need to take some time to reflect together on what Christ's warning and promise is here for uh, his people, because the tempter is especially uh, uh, jealous to, to go after the leaders of Christ's church. I mean, think about all of the damage that's been done. You can read about it throughout Scripture, the damage that's done uh, to the temptations that Jacob did uh, face as a father, the sin of Moses and how it affected his people, David's sin, of the sins of the disciples and how they will affect God's people. Satan loves to go after the leaders of Christ's flock. And so he gives these pointed instructions, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Two imperatives, watch and pray with a result or an aim that you enter not into temptation. In fact, I want to explore this in something of a reverse order. First of all, why are you to do those two things? What's the aim that you enter not into temptation? Uh, to get a little bit grammarly on you, uh, the that you may not is a purpose. It's a statement of uh, that this may not happen. Do these two things that this will not happen, that this goal, that this purpose would not happen. Entering into temptation. 
uh, that you would not enter into temptation if you watch and pray is the simple meaning here. And the, the sense of entering into temptation here is not just that temptations wouldn't be external to you, but in a sense that they wouldn't enter into us. To enter into temptation, uh, temptation first has to enter into us, that our, that our desires are for the thing that we are tempted for. And we are praying that our desires would not be for sin. Entering into temptation then is actually not just the step before sin, but the first step of sin. When our desires are for that, which is what we should not have, that we see some gain in sin, some pleasure, some comfort. It's a great danger to our souls. Sin is a matter of the heart, of the desires, not merely of an act. And here, Jesus warns, we should avoid our heart being led astray by temptation and desires and fight against them. And not just in our actions only, but before we ever enter into them, before we ever desire it, we are given these two instructions. Watch and pray. Again, I'll take them in reverse order. Pray. We're going to take the second command first. Why is this essential? John Owen writes in his work on temptation, it is not a thing in our own power to keep and preserve ourselves from entering into temptation. And prayer reminds us of this, that we are not of our own power not to enter into temptation. It's not a human thing that we're talking about here. And we can't just watch. Watching is that we might pray, that we might alert the one with power to save us from that temptation as well. Perhaps if you've watched any uh, military movies, you're familiar with JTAC, maybe not the acronym, but what it does. It's the Joint Terminal Attack Controller. It's a team that if calculates and calls in airstrikes uh, if you are facing an enemy of overwhelming power. And prayer, in a sense, is calling in an airstrike. Your team doesn't have a fighter that's on the ground with you, but you're calling in superior power to come along the way. Let me ask you, how often do you pray? against temptations and against the tempter. It's not merely a good idea here. It is a command to pray against temptation. In fact, even in Luke's version of the, the Lord's Prayer, he said, say these words, and it's in the Lord's Prayer. Is it not, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or in fact, the evil one. It's the same sort of temptation we are not to be led into, enter into, and we're to pray about that. In the Lord's Prayer, he's instructing us again. Remember how I taught you that before. He's not saying something new. In fact, it's part of the, the armor that's given in Ephesians 6, right? Part of the armor, we're told, is to be praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. All prayer and supplication does not sound like we should content ourselves just with a general prayer. All prayer and supplication means that there's more involved. In fact, that's why he says here, watch, right? There's a specificness to our prayers, just as there is with repentance. We don't content ourselves with a general, but with a specific or particular one. Well, watchfulness here is to be for that. What, is, what does watch mean? Well, there's, there's a, a very literal sense in this case in Mark 14, right? They were in a garden with danger approaching and they didn't even know it, right? They were to keep watch, and what happens at the end of it? He says, they're here. You were asleep. You were not watching. We are to be watchful for what may be coming towards us, what we are susceptible to, the seasons in which we particularly know about ourselves that we are tempted. We need to know ourselves enough to know that there may be times in which we are more tempted towards sin. For some of us, it's times of, uh, of prosperity, right? Things are going well, and then your guard is down. For others, it's the time in which we're down. We're in grief. We're in suffering and self-pitying, and instead we run to sin instead of our comforter. It can be times of spiritual slumber and idleness. It can be times of spiritual peaks. We know ourselves, or we should know ourselves well enough to know when we especially need to be watchful for times of, of temptations. Brothers and sisters, I wanted us to be reminded of this instruction because so many fall when they are not watchful. And a part of our watchfulness should be to look around and notice and take heed that others have fallen. You may know people who have personally fallen, especially in ministry, that have backslidden, perhaps have lost their callings in ministries, perhaps even have walked away from the faith. I think we should know of that. I think we should watch and know that this is a temptation but for the grace of God, go I. And we can't just say, well, they were different, right? 
they were a different sort of temptation that they dealt with, or they're a different sort of Presbyterian, and so they didn't have the tools available to them. No, it comes to all of us to be watching and praying. Praying realizes, but for the grace of God, I will fall, and I need to heed this warning, because there is no promise that you will not enter into, te into temptation unless you watch and you pray. If I may have a little indulgence to say what we should be watching for, especially as many here are thinking of going into the ministry and training for the ministry, these are three that I think we really need to watch for as elders and ministers in Christ's church. Watch and pray, especially for temptations of pride. We should be humbled by our positions, not exalted in them. If you uh, are in some area of leadership teaching in the church or in government or in business management, but particularly as a father and as a mother, your position should humble you, not puff you up, make you realize you need help, not to, to make you think that you have it all together. I mean, how many news stories do we have to watch about uh, mega church pastors and their falls from grace? Now, many of us who say, I'll never have to deal with that. I'm not going to be in a mega church. Well, uh, to quote John Owen, he warns his fellow Puritan uh, brothers of the temptations that may fall for us, not in the mega church, but in our studies. He warns the temptation of scholars. He writes, they set themselves up to study with all diligence day and night, a thing good in itself, but they do it that they might satisfy the thoughts and words of men wherein they delight. And so in all they do make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. I know a friend of mine that as I was going through seminary uh, set himself up uh, to be a scholar. That's all he wanted to be. And in fact, he really loved to have a paper that was, that was published and to get a lot of praise for it. Eventually, he fi figured that he had graduated from the ghetto of, of a Christian seminary to a secular university. And when he did, he got the praise for people uh, for questioning the Bible and its authority. Eventually, he left his unscholarly wife. He left the faith all together, all for the praise of men, because they told him his doubts were scholarly. For others of us, it may be temptations to lie, to, and those temptations may lie in the very thing that we're called to do, to preach the word. We may want to preach it so that we get praise rather than challenge our hearers. We too must watch and pray that we'd be humbled by our position, not exalted in it, that we should be preaching the word of God and not the words of men. Another thing that we should look for is not merely temptations of pride, but of addiction or false comfort. Perhaps we've seen a brother that has fallen from either too much to drink or other social uh, pressures that, that cause them to run to something else. I, I think of, uh, in my own denomination, we had a, a, um, uh, a former moderator of our General Assembly who shared very openly about how uh, he had a, um, a, an injury that resulted in him taking uh, painkillers that he then became addicted to. Then he went to them not for the pain, but for the stresses of his work. And eventually it took his pulpit. It took his position in ministry. And it scarred many of the souls of the people that he was ministering to. Satan loves to attack in places that we're not expecting. It wasn't drink. It wasn't pride. In fact, it was just these things of comfort that he thought there wasn't any kind of a, of a wrong thing to. And there wasn't at first, but eventually the things of substance took the place of the Spirit. Be drunk not on wine, but filled with the Spirit is a warning to us to not find our comfort in something other than our, the Holy Spirit. So be watchful over areas of pride. Be watchful over areas of addiction. And finally, over temptations of lust. I find it mind-boggling that I just turned 40 this year, and I've known personally four men who have fallen uh, from ministry over issues of sexual impurity some of which just lost their pulpit, some of which eventually the, the, the guilt and the stain of it eventually took their lives. There's temptation that is there, and it's not merely now in the, the shop down the street, but in the phones that we carry in our pockets, in our computers, in our homes. And it's a, it's a promise of, of a pleasure, but a pleasure that does not last. For a few moments of pleasure in an affair, in pornography, in lusting after a stranger and flirting with them. They all last for minutes, but the damage is for a lifetime. It rewires you in order to look at people not as your flock, but as objects. And we, we don't, we miss the sweet that is, uh, that is hidden uh, all around with the danger and the poison. Here's how Proverbs 7 paints the temptation of lust. 
When much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast and an arrow pierces its liver. As the bird rushes into the snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. Another false comforter. Watch for temptations. But also, remember, watch your position, meaning know the weight of what you do. We are speaking the word of God to God's people, and many of them look to that word as a comfort in their life. And in fact, for many of them, um, the flock is looking to you as, as a, a minister, as a, as a picture of Christ to them. I remember as a hospital chaplain, um, there was a time in which if, uh, if someone were to, to pass away, we were to go and we were to accompany the body. The nurse would take the body and go down to the morgue, but the chaplain was there to comfort the family. I remember this Christian family that was there that had lost their child, and there they held the body of their lifeless child as, as they didn't want to give up the body, and I, and I prayed with them. I prayed with them that as, as God had given that child into their, their hands to hold for a while, that they would now entrust that child to God's arms. And when I opened my eyes from prayer, they looked at the nurse, they looked at me, and handed the body to me. Because to them, I pictured the, them handing uh, their child into the arms of God. It is not a minor thing that we were entrusted with. And, and to think that we would throw that all away, to throw that all away for an addiction on the side, for, for an hour with a prostitute, for a little power that we can exercise over the sheep and some praise of men. We would throw that all away for that, watch and pray, especially brothers here entering the ministry, that you enter not into temptation. The danger is real. Many bodies of elders lay along the road who did not heed this warning. But don't just watch and pray. I think it's all dependent on your watching and praying. Think about Mark 14. What was happening there? The three disciples were sitting there, and within earshot, because they recorded the words, within earshot, they can hear what? their Savior, their Lord, praying for them. The flesh is weak. And sometimes we fall asleep in our praying and in our watching. We fail to be watchful. But what ultimately is our salvation, is our sanctification, are these promises dependent on, not on our performance, but in fact, in the garden, the, the Savior praying for us. In fact, he's praying there when he says, take the cup from me. But if there isn't another way, if there isn't another way for me to save my people, then I will endure even that for my bride. We contemplate way too little the work of Christ's intercession for us. Consider this. Peter was there. What was the difference between Peter entering into temptation and falling and him not? Only one reason I can find in all of Scripture, and that's Luke 22, 31 and 32. Christ said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. The decisive factor in Peter's perseverance was the intercession of Christ. But I prayed for you. Hold on to that, brothers. May that keep you awake. There's no greater promise or hope that we watch and pray, but whether or not we succeed and are perfect in our watching and our praying, our hope is in the prayers of Christ. The Father will not reject the petitions of the Son. No one for whom Christ died and prayed for will be lost. Amen? Amen. Sin is crouching at the door. The desire is for you. Watch and pray, remembering that the cost of failure is great, and the cost of that needed to be paid with Christ's blood. Watch and pray, knowing who prays for you. Let's pray. Father, at your right hand, your Son, our Savior, pleads for us. I pray that we would not be sluggish in our watchfulness, nor in our praying, that we would not enter into temptation. Keep before us the one who prays for us. Grant us gratitude in our callings and humility in our work. Amen.